Okay, this is going to be lecture number um, six. It's going to deal with World War One. We call this the Great War in world history. And I want to start it off by explaining to you what's going on in the world. We have got three countries that are heavily competing against each other in the imperialism system. These countries are England, Germany, and Russia. And the largest economy of the three is the British economy. And Germany is jealous of what England or Great Britain is up to in this time period. Now, these rulers of these three countries are all cousins. Their grandmother was Queen Victoria. So King George of England, the Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and Nicholas II of Russia are all first, second, or third cousins here in this time period. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had 10 children, and they made sure their children married into royalty all over Europe. So it's going to be a family affair is what World War I is really about, okay? Because they're trying to compete against each other, and Germany is mad because England is outdoing her as being a world power during this time period, okay? Now, the whole thing erupts here, guys, starting in 1900, when all these little countries begin to align themselves in military alliances or military orders. The people of Germany are going to bring in all the little German states. This includes Poland, Austria, Hungary. It's going to go into Bosnia. It's going to bring all these Central European countries under one umbrella, under the German rule, or the Central Powers, as it was called during this time period. England, France, Denmark, Russia, Japan, and Italy are under the ally alliance during this time period. And these alliances are all being formed before around 1900. So you kind of get an idea what's going on here. As early as 1910, Germany is mobilizing and starting to build an army. They're also starting to build a navy. And one of the premier tech, 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 uh, technologies of the new war is going to be submarines. Now, submarines came out of, the, out of the United States Civil War. We built submarines here in our country during, World War, during Civil War time period. And this technology is going to go over to Germany here, guys, at the beginning of World War I. So Germany is mobilizing during this time period. Wilhelm believes that he becomes the supreme power of the world if he can win World War I. Well, the trouble starts when Archduke Ferdinand goes down to Bosnia on a state visit here in, in June of 1914. He has his wife with him. He has an entourage of around nine people. And here in Bosnia, a radical Serbian who wants Serbia to be its own country and not part of Bosnia is going to assassinate Ferdinand, his wife, and all of the entourage. Okay, when this happens, the Serbian people begin to try to line themselves with Russia for protection. Bosnia has already lined itself with Germany. So here's where the counter peg, the counter peg explodes here, guys, is here in Bosnia and Serbia. These two little areas here, the Serbian people are living within the Bosnian population. The Serbian people want their own country. And of course, this art, this, this radical does nobody any favors when he blows up or he, or he kills Ferdinand and his entourage here, okay? The people of Syria are going to drag Russia into this affair. The people of Bosnia is going to drag Germany into this affair. Now, here's the clicker. During this time period, toward the end of June, early July of 1914, the Kaiser Wilhelm and Tsar Nicholas II and their families have gone on vacation, not together, but separate vacations, okay? The military leaders are the ones who gets the actual war started. By the time that Ferdinand gets, by the time that, that uh, Wilhelm gets back to, to Germany, by the time that Nicholas gets back to Moscow, war's already broken out. 
and this war has started on the 1st of August of 1914. This is called the Guns of August, 1914, August 1914 here, okay? Now here at home, we got a problem in 1914. President Wilson is going to have his wife, Ellen, pass away from a kidney ailment. The president is totally distraught when he loses Ellen. It is heard around the White House of him murmuring, what will I do? I need my partner in life, what will I do? So the president has lost his wife during this time period. Also on the Texas, Arizona, Mexico borders with, Mex with, with, uh, with Mexico, Mexico, let's start over again. On the borders of Arizona, New Mexico and Texas is a problem coming across the border with Mexico. And it's in the form of a military movement being, being housed or being, or being uh, planned by a man by the name of Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa is trying to regain some territory from the United States during this time period. President Wilson is forced to send the army down here to put down this rebellion against Pancho Villa. And the man he sends down here is General Pershing. General John J. Pershing is the gentleman he sends down here to put down this rebellion. And of course, it's gonna be pretty tough fighting because you're fighting in the Rocky Mountain regions. And it's pretty, it's kinda of like going to Afghanistan. It's pretty hard a place to fight a war here uh, in this time period, all right? And then Germany starts up again. May the 7th, 1915. May the 7th, 1915. The ocean liner Lusitania is gonna leave New York Harbor sailing to England. The ship's captain was told to, to sail the northern route to leave New York and head up toward Nova Scotia, make his way up toward Greenland and Iceland, and then come down from the top of Scotland. Well, the ship's captain disobeyed orders. He took the ocean liner right across the Atlantic Ocean and off the Irish coastline, he gets caught in a clubby of submarines. The Germans will shoot down, are going to blow up, torpedo the Lusitania. This ship had close to 1,200 people on board the ship, including over 130 Americans. Now the president could declare war right here, guys, but he did not, he wanted to negotiate. And he told Germany to leave our ships alone. It's during the same time period that Germany is going after our merchant fleet. Our merchant fleet is carrying war supplies into England during this time period, okay? So you got this going on. Germany suspects that the United States has put war supplies on board the Lusitania, and that's their excuse for blowing up that ship. So we're having problems with a merchant fleet, we have the Lusitania, and that's enough right there, guys, to declare war. But President Wilson is entering into the election for his second term, and he knows that if he goes into war as a first-term president, he will lose re-election. So he's slow to act on any of these issues because he wants to be re-elected to the presidency, okay? Then March of 1916, a French vessel heading into Calais out of the United States is gonna be sunk by German warships, by German submarines, and the Sussex is gonna go down and it takes with over 1,200 people, including around 130 Americans. And of course, the election is in November of 1916. This is March. So the president gives more warnings out here to Germany during this time period. Well, Congress will act on all of this. In June of 1916, they're gonna pass what is called the National Defense Act. The National Defense Act puts the National Guard under federal control. This is the first time the National Guard has ever gone under federal control. I want you guys to remember this. The Navy is always prepared. The Navy is always manned. There is no recruiting or trying to get volunteers for the Navy because they stay at 100% employment, okay? The National Guard is called in because the Army is only called in in times of major crisis. The army is not that big in this time period, okay? 
So they call the National Guard to help supplement the number of soldiers that are in the, in the federal army. And of course, the National Guard, they're gonna put 200,000 men under federal control in the National Guard, and their main concern is gonna be Homeland Security. Homeland Security, okay? So you guys remember that. The, the Coast Guard is also increased because they protect the harbors and the waterways coming into the United States. So this is all being looked at here, guys, under this time period. The National Defense Act is also gonna start trying to appropriate funding to start building war machines, to get us ready in case war does come our way. At least we can help our allies if they need help, particularly Great Britain, okay? Well, guys, the American people protested this. They did not like the idea of the United States having a National Defense Act getting for a war they do not see happening. And one of the main people who actually caused trouble is going to be Secretary of the State, Secretary of the State now, and he resigns. He leaves office because of it. That's not a good time for Secretary of State to be leaving office. And of course, his name was William Jennings Bryant, the old cowardly line from the Wizard of Oz. And he left office here, Secretary of State, when, when the Congress is going to pass the National Defense Act here. Also, the American women have protest over us going to war in Europe. They saw no need of us sending American boys, sons over to be slaughtered in a war. One of your big protesters with protesters was Jane Adams. Now these ladies will change their mind once we go to war. And these women will get heavily involved in the war efforts, particularly going to the factories to make war machines. So the ladies protest at first, and then they realize if we're gonna win this war and have no more war behind this one, they had to get involved in it. Okay, well, 1st February. 1917, Germany announced unrestricted warfare across the North Atlantic. Any boat was eligible to be shot down or be sunk. Okay. Now, guys, Mr. Wilson barely won re-election in November of 1916. He does not take the oath of office for a second turn until March the 4th. And here it is, guys, the 1st February, and Germany declares unrestricted warfare across the North Atlantic. On March the 1st, 1917, the spy network in, in England is, monitor, is monitoring, are monitoring all these different messages coming out of Germany. And these guys are really concerned about what the Kaiser Wilhelm is up to. All right, they have pretty much broken the German code and they know what's going on. And in this, they intercept a telegram that is going from Berlin to Mexico City. Arthur Zimmerman, Secretary of State for Germany, is sending word to the ambassador at Mexico City that he wants him to make an agreement with Mexico to allow the two armies to merge together, have German army go over to Mexico, merge with Mexico's army, and attack the American Southwest to pick up where Pancho Villa has left off. Okay? This is a direct threat to the United States. Okay? So they're planning to attack the Southwest to keep America from going to Europe for a war. All right? The president receives the actual transcript of the telegram around the middle of March. And he reviews it with his people and with his cabinet members and so forth. And on April the 2nd, 1917, President Wilson goes before Congress to address them about the Zimmerman note. And in his speech, President Wilson tells the American people we must make the world safe for democracy. We must make the world safe for democracy. On April the 6th, 1917, the United States Congress declares war on Germany. Okay, the vote in the House was 373 to 6. And the, I'm sorry, it's 373 to 5. 
and in the Senate, it was 82 to 6. So the vast majority here, guys, almost 90 percent, wants war against Germany here in this time period. Okay? Listen, we're not prepared for no war in America. We have not had a war effort since the Spanish War against Spain in, in 1898 time period. And a lot of the people who were generals and who were leaders of this, of this army are long gone. They're having a hard time to trying to find people qualified to train the new soldiers for World War I. It's a mess out here. Okay, but we're trying to build an infrastructure. We're trying to get the army together. We're behind the eight ball here, trying to get ready for a war. This is a war that America should have never gone to and let, let the Europeans settle it on their own. But President Wilson is convinced that since he's a historian, a PhD historian, that he can write policies for world peace, that he'll be the savior of the world, that he'll go down in history as the last president in America who faced going to war that he had a plan to end all wars in this time period. Now I want to tell you something about, about Wilson. Wilson is a, is a devout Presbyterian. He's a devout Christian. And he believes in white supremacy. As a matter of fact, in 1915, he had a special showing of, of a birth of a nation, that old racist Civil War theme motion picture about the, about the Confederacy. He had it shown in the White House. And a lot of people were horrified that the president would show such a movie in the White House. And of course, by him showing that movie in the White House, it gave all these white supremacists around the country, and there were millions of them, the right to go through and reform the Ku Klux Klan. And by 1918, 1919, President Wilson is backing up the Ku Klux Klan. Remember, he's a Southern president. He came out of Virginia. That's where he was born. He was raised in Georgia. But he also was the president at Princeton University as the governor of New Jersey. So there's a lot of people who back up the beliefs that Wilson believes when it comes to Christianity and white supremacy. Okay? They believe they're protecting the nation from foreign influences, from downfall, by having this protection of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a major problem here, guys, in the 1920s. And we'll discuss more of that when I get into the 1920s and the, and the next lecture and what the Klan is really up to here uh, in this time period. And by the way, lynchings did resume by the hundreds, by the thousands across the South while Wilson was president. Lynchings resumed all during the 1920s. As a matter of fact, the NAACP, the NAACP in 1919 had a special promotion against lynchings, trying to end it. Do y'all know that we had several dozen American soldiers come home from the war? A lot of these young men were from Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi. They came home wearing their uniforms from World War II, from World War I, and they were lynched. They were lynched wearing their uniforms. One writer wrote, we went to war fighting, we come home fighting that there's no peace here in this time period, okay? So this is a major problem here in this time period. We're trying to fight a war in Europe, but a war here in America is starting to evolve over white supremacy here in this time period. And the Ku Klux Klan not only makes war against African Americans, they make war against Jewish Americans and Asian Americans and Latino Americans and other groups that they see as not being purely white. So you get an idea what's happening here uh, in this time period. Well, President Wilson has got another problem. In 1917, you got close to 40 million people who have come to America from European countries. A lot of these folks have not been naturalized as being citizens yet. And a lot of the ones who are citizens are identifying with their European countries who are at war against each other. And President Wilson realizes real quickly that a war could break out in America against the same groups in Europe that have come to America. They identify themselves as being German Americans, 
and, uh, and Hungarian Americans and Czechoslovakian Americans and Bosnian Americans and Armenian Americans and Turkish Americans and so forth and so on. And President Wilson realized that he's got to get these people on the same page. We have got to identify ourselves as being Americans with no hyphens. Well, he's going to hire a spin master, an advertising gentleman, whose name is George Creel. George Creel is from Missouri, and he knows all about American white supremacy. He knows all about the racism, but most importantly, he realizes what the South had done to identify themselves as a special people after the American Civil War. William Faulkner calls this the rage to explain. The rage to explain what they did, why they did it, and now they must face the outcome. He does a really good job explaining this in a book that is called Absalom, Absalom. It deals with a family that is going to be torn apart by the American Civil War. Okay? George Creel says the Southern people at the end of Reconstruction have come together and they have formed what is called a social gospel. Okay? This social gospel has made the South into a separate sphere within the United States. Okay? This new lost cause mythology is the South trying to explain what they did and why they did it. One of my professors at Ole Miss wrote a book called Baptized in Blood that deals with this topic here of this new national look the South gave itself away from the American ideology of patriotism. The American South is going to try to find ways to explain themselves, and they do it by having to deal with the gospel, to make it look like a church event. Okay? When you go to church, you got a sermon. And the sermon for the American South was a lost cause, and how these gallant knights in armor left their homes in Alabama and Georgia and the Carolinas, Mississippi and Florida, and went to go through and fight, and fight against those Yankee devils. They're trying to defend their homeland. They're trying to defend their women from rape and pillage by other people not considered to be white. In other words, they held the women on a pedestal. Okay? So this old mythology here, it begins to evolve. Now, I'll tell you guys something. It's not the soldiers who do this. It's not the Civil War soldiers who do this. Oh, they do get involved in it, but it's their wives and their sisters and the old maids and the old maids who lost their sweethearts in the war. That's the group in the 1890s and early 1900s begin to put up statues across the South of who they consider to be their Civil War heroes, their patron saints of the South. If you had a general from your county that fought in the Civil War time period, your county seat put a statue up to him. Look at New Orleans. They had a bunch of generals on pedestals in, in circles in the middle of the streets of New Orleans. Atlanta's got Stone Mountain that's got a carving of Robert E. Lee and Beauregard and Jackson and all those folks on the side of Stone Mountain. This was all done in the 1960 time period. That's the Mount Rushmore of the South is at Stone Mountain, Georgia. So they put up all these statues to remind you of the lost cause. Okay, a lot of historians told them, do not do this. It's not a good thing to do. We have museums. Y'all build a great Civil War museum for your state or for your county, and you put those statues on the grounds or inside the buildings of those museums. But they wanted to flaunt it here, guys. They wanted to show it off. Okay, this is why William Faulkner said it's a rage to explain. It was a rage going on here, guys, in this time period. Okay, so the message is going to be the lost cause. That's your sermon. Well, you know, when you go to church, 
you're going to have your song service. And y'all will sing songs for the first half hour of church or have a special song to you, whatever. Well, here's where the old Southern songs came into play in this mythology. Okay? The first one is going to be the song Dixie. That song was written in the 1840s. It was written as part of the, a part of the old vaudeville, the old minstrel shows of that time period. Stephen Foster's music, Way Down Upon a Swanee River, My Old Kentucky Home. These songs become part of the hymn service of the South. So they bring these old songs up, guys, that should have been put in museums, and they bring them to the lot to the limelight. And matter of fact, guys, the song Dixie was, was played regularly at all your baseball games and all your football games and basketball games until the 1980s. Ole Miss got rid of that of the song Dixie in, in the late eight in the late 1980s. They got rid of they got rid of Colonel Rev and all that southern mythology of the lost cause that Ole Miss was celebrating as their mascots and as their music for the, for the, for the school. Alabama and Auburn and Florida and all these Southern colleges were heavily involved in their, band, in their bands playing Dixie, usually at the end of the halftime show on the football fields. Okay? So this mythology is kept alive. Then you have your patron saints. Your patron saints are your famous Civil War generals of the South. Beauregard, Longstreet, Stonewall Jackson. You'll have uh, um, Albert Sidney Johnson. You'll have your president, who was Jefferson Davis, your vice president, who's Alexander Stevens. All these become patron saints here, guys, of the lost cause. All right? And then, of course, you had your, your icons. These were cannons in the battlefields, the name of battlefields, places they remember here, guys, in this time period. The uniforms of the Confederates, the whole nine yards becomes part of it. And President Wilson, who grew up in this lost cause mythology, and so did George Creel, he grew up also in this lost mythology here, guys, this lost cause mythology, they decide to make an American mythology. They said if it worked for the South to pull them together as a people who see themselves in a like manner, why not have it as a national event? And they titled this all around the word patriotism. To make America a patriotic place where no people have a hyphen between their former nation, nations and their new nations that we are all Americans. Wilson told them, when your grandpa and your grandma arrived here and went through Ellis Island, when they stepped out on the ferry going to Manhattan, at that time they were Americans, that their hyphens had been dropped, okay? So this is important that y'all realize what's happening here, okay? The new symbol for this new religion is gonna be a gentleman whose name is Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is the average American who's going to fight for American democracy, American freedom. He's going to make sure the world is safe for democracy. Okay, so instead of having Christ as your figure here, you're going to have Uncle Sam. He's the man you're looking up to in this time period. Okay, they also brought in the icons to go with Uncle Sam. And of course, he is an icon. They brought in the American flag. All during this war, the Americans flew their flags on their front porches or in their front yards. Wagons and T-model Fords and the horseless carriages had American flags that flew from the sides of them. The American people showed their patriotism by the flag waving. Okay? Your patron saints, or the other icons, I should say, are going to be the Statue of Liberty, the Liberty Bell, Okay, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, those are your icons here in this time period. Your founding fathers become your patron saints, and they will include Ben Franklin, George Washington, Ben Rush, John Adams, Samuel Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, 
They'll even go as far as to include Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt. Remember, guys, within about 30 or 40 years, Roosevelt, Franklin, I mean, Theodore Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington would be made up on Mount, on, on, uh, Mount Rushmore. So you're going to see these patron saints being honored here on Mount Rushmore. Okay? So you get an idea what's happening here, guys. The sermon is going to be the world made safe for democracy. Not the lost cause, but a world being made safe for democracy. And then your music, your hymns, will be the Battle Hymn of the Republic, America the Beautiful, and the Star Spangled Banner, and plus hundreds of others. They'll be written. You know, on Tin Pan Alley in, on, in, on Long Island, or on uh, Manhattan of New York, a bunch of these composers began to write patriotic songs for World War, for World War I. Irving Berlin was well known for writing patriot songs in this time period. You know, one of the songs was, would say, over there, over there, the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming over there. And that was telling the Europeans to get ready because we're going to come and get that war in. Okay, so George Creel is going to start this new patriotism for the American people to drop the hyphens and see themselves as one people. And it worked. It still works today. Your political campaigns today are based upon this patriotism that George Creel and, and, and President Wilson developed here to get America involved in World War I. Okay, now also in this period of time from 1910 until, until the war effort starts, we've got a major motion picture business started. They're streaming these silent movies here and people are going to the movies. And you have stars like Clara Bow, you have got uh, Mr. Uh, Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin, you got Buster Keaton, You've got several well-known, several dozen well-known stars of the movie theaters that people look up to. We even had magazines that featured these stars of the silver screen during this time period. And so they're going to recruit these film stars to go across the country on trains to sell war bonds. You know, I wish we did this today. Back in the old days, we sold war bonds to pay for war. You would go through and put a certain percentage of your salary each week into war bonds. And these war bonds pay between eight and 10% interest. And they didn't, were not being paid off for 30 years. So if you bought several thousand dollars in war bonds during World War I, by 1940, you had enough money to retire on and not have to worry about any kind of financial problems in your old age. That'd be a great way today for us to go through and, and pay for these military exploits we go on, trying to, to pay for them. Instead of taking out of the federal treasury, have the American people pay for them and get dividends off of these war bonds. And so these folks, they go out and they start selling these war bonds here. And a lot of these were people who worked in New York, they worked on Manhattan, they worked on Long Island, and the movie industry. Now, guys, Hollywood does not come along until about 1923. There'll be a large group of Jewish film producers out of Germany, out of Russia, out of the Russian states who will come to America, and they will build these great studios in California, mainly around Burbank, California. And that becomes Hollywood in the 1920s. So before you have Hollywood, you got New York City and Long Island is where they made motion pictures here during this time period. Okay, now Congress is going to have a Selected Service Act that's going to say that yet young men between the ages of 21 and 35 are eligible for their military service. The, the, the boys between the ages of 21 and 35 are eligible for military service. Remember, you're not an American, you're not a full adult in America until you hit the age 21. So that's going to change in the 1970s. In the early 1970s, they take the voting age from 21 down to 18, and they raise the drinking age from 18 to 21. 
So that all changed in the early 1970s. So here, if you're 21 years of age or 35 years of age, you're eligible to go into the, into the war. And they asked for volunteers. And most of the boys did volunteer. There were a few drafts, but not very many drafts took place during this time period. As a matter of fact, by June the 5th, 1917, remember the war was declared on April the 6th. By June the 5th, over 10 million American boys had registered for the draft or had registered to serve in this war. And out of this 10 million boys, the United States Army is going to choose just under 3 million. Actually, it's 2.8 million. 2.8 million young men will serve in World War I. Okay? Now, here's the problem. A lot of these boys are from cities. These boys from Boston and New York and Philadelphia and Detroit and a lot of these larger urban areas had never shot a gun. The boys in the American South, the boys in the Midwest who lived in rural areas, they were experts when it came to, to shooting guns. But a lot of the boys, over half your boys, have no experience here at all in handling a gun. They're trying to find former military leaders to come in and train these young boys in training camps. They had a hard time finding them. They had to go through and train men in order to teach the men how to go through and fight in, the, in this war. Then they decided to build training camps. And the most desirable area for training camps was the American South, the American Southwest. Today it's called the Sun Belt. And so for the first time you have military training bases, they'll be located across the South, mainly in North Carolina around Fayetteville, around South Carolina, Camden, and, and uh, in, uh, um, Columbia, and Charleston. You'll have training camps in Augusta, Georgia, and of course down in Warner Robins, Georgia, around Macon, around Savannah. You'll have training facilities. You'll have an, also at Fort Benning. You'll have training facilities at Fort Rucker. Pensacola Air Station had training facilities. Okay, you had Camp Shelby over in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. You had a big training camp over in Bossier City, Louisiana. And you had training camps all over Texas, mainly around, uh, around San Antonio area of Texas. So these areas become the training centers where all these boys are brought in by troop trains to be trained for at least six months in these training camps. All right. A lot of these camps didn't even have any kind of equipment for the boys to train on. They didn't have the trucks or the artillery or the tummy guns the boys needed for training. They had to make believe that sticks and bricks for hand grenades were used for training. They had to make believe that these were actual tools of war here, guys. They were just playing wars all they were doing, like a bunch of kids out there, a bunch of 12 year olds out there playing war in the woods. Okay? So they won't be extremely well trained here in this time period. These training camps will be opened in the fall of 1917, which means the boys won't be ready to go to Europe until March of 1918. All right? So it's going to be a long training period here. And of course, these boys will leave their training camps. And they're going to go by railroad troop trains to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Y'all remember, guys, that every 20 miles of the train tracks is a, is a train station. And about every hour, hour and a half on the, on the railroad, they would stop at one of these towns or one of these cities. And here the USO girls would bring out donuts, hot coffee, and so forth. The boys had a chance to go and relieve themselves and to get ready to get back on the train again to go for another 150 or 200 miles before the next stop takes place, okay? They do not realize it, but here in the summer and fall of 1918, they're carrying a virus, a pandemic, across the country with them. This is called the Spanish flu. This flu becomes a major pandemic in, 18, eight, in 1918 and 1919. And here's what caused it. In these training camps, 
they decided to feed the soldiers either hogs or chicken. They had either pork or chicken for their main meals. That's their main meat to eat. So they brought the hog pens, the hog farms, and put them right next door to the training camps. They built large chicken houses, and they put 10,000 chickens in a chicken house, and they slaughtered them there in the training facilities. Yeah, out behind the mess halls, they butchered hogs, and they went through and they cleaned these chickens to be fried or to be made into chicken salad or or to chicken and dumplings or whatever, chicken and rice, whatever, okay? When you have large animals, large number of animals around the human population, you've got a lot of waste material to deal with. A lot of hog manure, chicken manure, and feathers. So they decide the best way to handle the situation is put men inside of these hog farms inside of these chicken houses, using wheelbarrows, remove the manure out of these houses. Okay, and they piled them into big piles and they burned it. When they burned this manure and all the boys in these training camps began to breathe in that unpure air, their lungs get congested. They'll get bronchitis, they'll get pneumonia, they'll have the full-fledged flu. As these boys here in the summer of 1918 made their way to Europe across America on these troop trains, they're carrying the flu with them, this pandemic. Over in England, they're doing the same thing. But in England, they got boys from South Africa. They got boys from Turkey in the Middle East. They have got boys from India and from China and from Japan and from Malaysia, Singapore, and Australia. In other words, the flu out of Europe is going to go across the whole Eastern Hemisphere. It's going to go all the way from London, England, all the way down to Australia, New Zealand. And this pandemic becomes a major world killer in World War I. We had close to 34 million people to die in the flu of 1918-1919. It is called the Spanish flu, a major pandemic. If y'all will go and read the lecture notes in lecture number six, you'll see a pretty good size article that deals with the Spanish flu of 1918-1919. Okay? A lot of folks died from the flu. Your president got the flu. President Wilson got the flu. When he came home from Europe in, in the summer of 1919, he had the flu. Four months later, he has a major stroke. Can no longer be the president, his wife, his new wife, his second wife, Edith Galt, becomes your president during this time period because she keeps all of his medical information hidden from the American people. She tells everybody to go through her and she'll go to the president to get his decisions. And we believe that for 18 months of the, toward the end of his second term, President Wilson was so sick from having a stroke that his wife took care of all of the country's affairs. So she can be considered probably being the first woman president during this time period. And this is when women are getting the right to vote in 1919 time period. So it's an interesting little period of time here about all of this stuff and the, and the results of pandemics upon population. A lot of folks did die prematurely because they had the flu. Their lungs were, were, were destroyed inside. A lot of them could not breathe. By the time they're 45 and 50 years old, they're not here anymore. They have died from the effects of the flu in this time period, okay? So these pandemics reap a lot of mischief after they have been pretty much solved uh, in their time periods, okay? And by the way, the American people in 1919 were told to wear a mask, and the people of America did wear their masks. Social distancing, 
staying into small, to staying in small groups of people. Don't get into large areas that you can spread the flu to one another to keep everything pretty small and keep your distance and wear your mask. And that went a long way to curing the problem of this flu. And by 1921, the flu has totally disappeared. So there's lessons from 1919 that apply to today's world. Uh, in, in this pandemic with, with, uh, with the, uh, with the CB19 uh, infections we have today, okay? So guys, we're going to start building these training facilities across the South, and these men will receive their training here. President Wilson is going to bring John J. Pershing back from the Southwest and put him in charge of the American Expedition Forces, the American Army in Europe. And he tells John, John J. Pershing one thing, do not let the Europeans control the American army. If you let those British generals get a hold of the American soldiers, they'll send them on suicide missions. And I wanna tell you something, England genocide, a lot of Australians, a lot of Irishmen, a lot of people from India and Turkey on battles that were of no, of no use, of no purpose, of no gain, if you want to put it that way. And so President Wilson told John J. Pershing, you maintain a separate American army. Now I will tell you this, when the army first appears here in Europe in February of 1918, by the, by the, by the first part of June, a lot of African-American soldiers are put in with the French and they're put on the front lines. They use these guys as suicide, for suicide missions, okay? These men were mostly from Harlem, New York, okay? James Reese Europe was the commander of this group, and he's, a, he's, a bone, he's, a, he's known as a blues musician. Mr. Europe is from Mobile, Alabama, and his soldiers in his group, most of them were musicians, they played jazz music here in Europe during the during this time period, these men were put on the front lines going out of the trenches. If you guys want to see a good example of trench warfare, I want you to watch a movie that came out in the last year that is called 1917. And that's a very good movie to get a good feeling of how this war was fought. And today's historians are involved in movie making and they are looking for a complete accuracy in these movies. So you guys get a chance, y'all watch 1917, and you'll get an idea what it was like in this trench warfare here. These American soldiers here out of Harlem were so brave and such good freedom fighters that they won every medal that the French had for their military. Every medal. And they nicknamed the guys the Hell Fighters. And these men will come home and be celebrated for their bravery here in World War I. Okay? So the African-American soldiers are very important here in this time period. Okay? Another thing we did I think is quite interesting for you guys to know about. A lot of history books don't even discuss this at all. They brought in the Corps Engineers to France. The Corps Engineers were put at all of the harbors along the English Channel and along the Atlantic coastline of France. And the Corps Engineers are going to build American style railroads all the way to Paris. This allows America's infrastructure, their war infrastructure to, to land here on the coastline of France and be in Paris within a couple of days. The sailing time across the Atlantic Ocean was one week. So within 14 days of leaving those industrial plants, in some cases, the supplies were already in Paris being stockpiled for future, for future uses along the, along the Western Front, along the trenches here between France and Germany. And then they built the railroads from Paris to the front line. They brought in the trucks. These American trucks were were designed so they'd be hard to get stuck in mud. They had big, huge wheels on them. They had lower gears on them. They actually went through and built plank roads and cobblestone roads to carry these trucks up here. Sometimes the trucks were put on the train cars 
and delivered to the Western Front and then unloaded from the trains and be used in service here along the area. You know, probably the most horrendous thing was that trench warfare, living in those trenches. 1917 shows all those trenches. They were usually had water in the trenches in the bottom. People were wading in their boots in this water. A lot of the boys got what's called trench mouth and trench foot. It's from, it's from bacteria that lives in the mud and the clay that you're actually working in. They slaughtered hogs and chickens in the trenches. You had all that stench in there, and nothing smells any worse than rotted meat. This was all here, guys, in these trenches. So you had some real health issues here in the trenches. These boys came home with trench foot. When I was a little kid living in Laurel Hill in the late 1950s, my next door neighbor loved to make pickles. She had a big, huge garden full of cucumbers. And she got out her zinc tubs and her salt and her vinegar and, and all of her preserving spices that she used to make her pickles with. And she made tons of pickles on her front porch. She told the story about her brother coming home from war, World War II. And he had trench foot and they could not cure it. His feet was literally rotting away. They smelled horrendous. And she said that one afternoon or one weekend, her mother decided to make pickles. And he came by the house and he took his shoes and socks off. And in that liquid that was left over from making those pickles, he put his feet in that liquid. And she said he screamed at a high pitched scream. And he kept his feet in that water as long as he could stand it. And within one month, his feet had cleared up. He got rid of that trench foot. So it's interesting when you talk about war and people telling stories, but you can find out here, guys, about how bad warfare actually is. And sometimes the cure is nothing but old home remedies that this young man here experienced here in Laurel Hill in 1945. Okay? So guys, Trench warfare is going to be pretty disgusting, to say the least, okay? The American soldiers do not arrive in any great numbers until June of 1918. And you're going to soon have close to 2 million American boys that are in Europe. You know, I got tickled reading about all this stuff. The, the French and the English leaders here, they were fighting the war in France, these generals here, thought when the Americans showed up, they'd have a bunch of cowboys. Yeah, they didn't watch those American movies. They had cowboys and Indians in them. And they thought that the American boys were all going to be cowboys, big old macho boys, and whip Germany within a couple of days. When the, when the French minister saw the American boys for the first time, he was very disgusted. He said, I wanted cowboys, and all I got were Boy Scouts. All I got were, got were Boy Scouts. But these boys will learn pretty quickly how to fight war, okay? Now, here at home, we're gonna spend close to $14 billion in making new war supplies. There'll be over 3,000 war contracts that will total up to almost $15 billion in, in actual cost to produce these goods. The American women are the ones who stepped in to provide us with this war machinery. The women realized that if they did a good job in World War I, that they could possibly get the vote. Now, Prohibition, the temperance movement, was still expanding by 1918 out of 48 states, like 45 were totally dried up. Prohibition is on its way. And the women had used this temperance movement, this prohibition movement, trying to gain the vote. So with them having this sewn up pretty much and their war effort sewn up pretty much, you're going to soon have the 19th Amendment that allow women to have the right to vote. And that will come in 1919. They'll finally get the right to vote. The first election American women will vote in is for the presidency of 1920. The election of 1920 is when the American women for the first time will vote for a presidential candidate here. 
okay? You also had the Great Migration going on during this time period. Over 500,000 African-American men, young men, are leaving the South and going North for industrial jobs. They're going North to find industrial jobs. You also have close to 700,000 white American young men, just like the black young men, trying to escape Jim Crow, trying to escape the convict lease system. They too will go North to try and to find industrial jobs during the war. So over a million, about 1.3 million Southerners will leave the South and go North for war jobs during this time period. Okay. Now, something to point you guys to realize here. These African Americans are trying to find a way to build cities for themselves that are segregated. They want to build communities, townships, urban areas in which black Americans are in control of. White America has no influence in their new communities. Okay, this is going to lead to the Harlem Renaissance here in Harlem, New York in the early 1920s. Okay, and you'll see groups of, of black families and these black young people go to new towns and try to build a new area just for them without any kind of white influences. They realize that white America is never going to help black America that white supremacy is so strong, the Ku Klux Klan's are rising, and the only protection they see for themselves is to be segregated from white society. And this is taking place during this time period. You also have race riots that take place here during and around World War I. We had a major race riot during the war at East St. Louis, Illinois. East St. Louis is right across the river from St. Louis. And here you had a major riot take place between black workers and white workers. You had one in Chicago, it took place on the beach here on Lake Michigan. A, a young black group decided to come in here to, to enjoy the nice sunny weather on the beaches here. They didn't know it was an all white beach, just a Jim Crow beach. And a riot broke out. And you had over a thousand people arrested here in Chicago during this great riot. We had one in St. Augustine, Florida in 1921. It involved a little place called Rosewood. Rosewood was an all black community. These people had come together, formed their society, formed their community away from the white folks. They lived on the outskirts of St. Augustine, Florida. One of the white women reported to the white officials in St. Augustine, that she had been raped by a man over in Rosewood, that she had been beaten and raped by this man. And a lynch mob goes out to Rosewood and burns the whole community down. Then it turns out she lied. Her, her husband had beaten her and raped her, that no black man was involved in it. Where do y'all think Harper Lee got the background for To Kill a Mockingbird? Tulsa, Oklahoma. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, you had a big downtown area, but you, had, you also had a large black area of Tulsa. It was called the Black Wall Street of the time period. A lot of financial institutions, a lot of people borrowed money out of, out of, out of, out of Tulsa and so forth here in their African-American community. This white woman goes to downtown to a department store. She buys several items, she's got it in her hand. She goes to the elevator. The elevator comes up. There's a black man inside the elevator who operates the elevator. The threshold didn't quite meet up like it should have and she tripped getting into the elevator and her head was heading toward the metal bar. She had hit it, it would have killed her. And he stopped her from hitting that bar. And she accused him of rape. And the people of Tulsa went out to this black section of town and burned it to the ground. Burned it to the ground. So you have all this going on here, guys. We're trying to make the world safe for democracy. What is happening at home? 
the lynching of soldiers in uniforms, these race riots, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. You get an idea what's happening here in this time period. And it's gonna be a big mess. This has only been a hundred years ago, guys. A hundred years ago in America, okay? All right, this war is gonna cost United States 13, I'm sorry, for $33 billion to fight. It's gonna cost the Americans $33 billion to fight this war, okay? It's also during this war in 1917 that the Bolsheviks are going to capture Tsar Nicholas and his family. They carry them to Siberia where they're executed. And here comes what is known as the Russian Revolution. The leader is going to be it's going to be V I Lenin L E N I N, and Russia goes to communism. We could have done the same thing, guys, in 1905 if Teddy Roosevelt had not reigned in the wealthy class. Run the progressives, because Russia did not do it, and now the people go under. Communist rule for the next 60 years. And of course, they're still in a form of communism even today, but it's not as bad as it was before. Do y'all know that V.I. Lenin went after political enemies? Executed over 10 million people. He was only there until 1924. From 1917 to 1924, he genocided over 10 million people. Some people say it's as high as, as 20 million people. His successor is going to be Joseph Stalin, and Joseph Stalin is going to genocide over 20 million people before World War II breaks out, political enemies, you know? He went to the Ukraine and genocide 4 million people in 1932. We should not ever never join the Russians in World War II or have them join us because they were just as guilty of humanitarian disaster as Hitler was. But yet in World War II, we called him Uncle Joe. Oh, isn't that sweet? Uncle Joe of Russia. When he died in 1953, we realized what a beast he was. And we should have got rid of him in 1945, when the war ended in Europe, just head right on to Russia and get rid of communism too. And that was one of the plans to do that. But since Joseph Stalin was our uncle, we didn't even go through and hurt Uncle Joe. So we let him be. We didn't go after him for all of his crimes and all of his sins that he had, that he had done. We got to be careful, guys, with who we support in the world and how we treat these people because they do come back to bite us. It's just part of it here. Okay? Because of Russia falling into communism in June of 1917, in June of 1917, the United States Congress will pass what is called the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act of 1917. This act is to guarantee homeland security. It also is going to violate the freedom of speech. It tells the American people you cannot criticize the American Congress, the American Supreme Court, the president, nor the military, that you cannot write or say anything against the American leadership during this war, the violation, of, the violation of the freedom of speech. And they also said, if you do this, you'll have, you can be sentenced up to 20 years in federal prison and charge $10,000 in fines. You know, we discussed the Pullman train car strike back in 1893 and 94, when Grover Cleveland sent the army in to put down the strike. Well, one of the leaders of that strike was named Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs was arrested for being a socialist, and he goes to prison. And while in prison, he founds what is called the American Socialist Party. In 1912, as a free man, he runs as a socialist in the election of, eight, of 1912. This is when Taft and Roosevelt and Wilson went at it against each other. Y'all know that Mr. Debs received over a million votes in 1912, and here in 1918, in June of 1918, at Canton, Ohio, Mr. Debs makes a speech that is totally anti-American. 
he violates every rule in the Espionage Act. And he's arrested and he's sent to federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1920, as a prisoner locked up in the Atlanta Penitentiary, the Atlanta Federal Prison, Eugene Debs runs for the presidency. He runs as a socialist and receives almost a million votes in 1920's election. By the way, President Harding, who wins the election of 1920, is going to pardon Eugene Debs. He'll let him out of prison here uh, around 1921 time period, 22 time period. Okay? All right. Now, guys, the war is horrendous. This war was started in 1914. It started in August of 1914. By the time the Americans are in full force, this is the summer of 1918, close to 25 million people have died in this war. 25 million people have died in this war by the time the Americans show up. That includes Russians and Germans and, and the the French and the British and the whole nine yards. That's a lot of death here. The estimates are close to 10 million civilians had died in this war. Then you add 34 million people are gonna die from the Spanish flu in and around this war. You're gonna have close to 80 million people who die between 1914 and 1919. That's a high casualty rate here, guys around the world. And you know what's interesting, guys? The boys who fought in World War I were born between 1870, 1870 and 1897. My grandpa, because he was always upset because he couldn't go to World War I. He was born in, he was born in 1899. He, didn't, he was too young to go to war. But his brothers who did go to war told him how grateful he should have been because he did not go to war. Well, these boys saw a lot of trouble here in World War I. You know, one of the big things here is going to be mustard gas. They use gas warfare here, guys. This mustard gas would attack all your moist areas of your bodies. It attacked your nose, your mouth, your ears, your eyes your underarms, your genital areas, any place where there's moisture, it attacked it. And people came out of this war blinded because of mustard gas. A lot of boys were extremely wounded in this war and could not go back home. They had lost both legs. Sometimes they had both lost both legs and both arms. And we realized that these boys could never go home again. And in 1920, actually 1921, under President Harding, we're going to start the Veterans Affairs to build veterans hospitals for the boys who could not go home. Over 400,000 boys were extremely wounded in this war. We was only there, guys, just about, about six months. You can imagine we've been there for three or four years, what the death toll would have been uh, in, in this war. Okay, we had a little over 200,000 who died in the war, but about 400,000 were severely wounded in this war. Okay, so mustard gas was a major, major problem here in this war. They used barbed wire. Boys would get caught in barbed wire. They'd be shot up in the barbed wire. Like I said, go watch 1917 and you'll see all of this and how bad it actually was here in this war. And when, this, when that movie comes available, I'm going to put it on my, on my movie list here on Blackboard so y'all can click on it and watch it directly from uh, face from Facebook or, or from YouTube or whatever I can find it that I can show it to you guys on. Okay. This war was horrendous. This war is going to end an armistice. The armistice takes place on the 11th day of November 1918. 11 November 1918, that is Veterans Day. That is when the war ended. It ended on the 11th hour of the 11th month of the 11th day. Boys died until the very last minutes of this war. Okay. So this is a very interesting war here. The armistice was signed here in this time period. 
A lot of your leaders want the people of Germany to pay the cost of this war. The European powers are, de are determined that Germany is going to pay and pay dearly for this war. Okay? The Russians are going to lose over 9 million people in this war. The French lost over 5 million people. The Germans lost 6 million people. And the British lost 2 million people. Remember the soldiers of this war were from 1870 until 1897. The boys of World War II were born between 1905 and 1926. So this whole two whole generations that were lost because this, of this war. Okay? And of course, in this war, a lot of the soldiers returning home were called the lost boys or the lost soldiers uh, that have been in this war here. Okay, civilian so deaths, they believe, total close to 22 million people. How did America win the war so quickly? Superior weapons, new technology. You know, guys, it's there in this time period that we go, we're going from steam power and our industries to electricity and our industries. All the new machinery of World War I is going to build a consumer culture for the 1920s. And anything you want, American industry can build it for you. Get whatever you dream, we can build it. So the new American industries are being formed here because of World War I. The women go to the workplace and these women bring reform to the workplace. Women need bathroom breaks. Every two hours, you got a 15 minute bathroom break. You could have a 30 minute break in the, in the, more, in the mid morning, in the mid afternoon, and get an hour break for lunch. They brought in mess halls, so you have lunch available to you in the factory. They brought in physicians and nurses and brought in health care clinics within the factory system. So if you got hurt on the job, you could go to the clinic and get treated here without having to go to a hospital. They also brought in daycare centers because the women need a place for kids to go that was suitable for them to stay all day. Women would come in with their, with their little kids, drop them off in the daycare center, go get them for lunch, eat lunch with them, put them back in the daycare center. If one of the kids had a little snuff, snuffy nose or whatever, they take them to the clinic. So the new American workplace is being evolving here in World War I when the women go to work. Women need special attention here in this time period. Okay? And these women want to have have a good, clean work environment to work in that was suitable for them and their children with good food available for them to have during their lunch period. And sometimes that's all they had to eat all day. They might come in early and get a cinnamon roll or a biscuit and then go to work and then midday have their main meal. And then in the nighttime, just kind of scrounge around, eat apples and maybe some cheese and some crackers and just eat real light uh, during the supper time, during the evening time. So these women are going to change the workplace. When the men get home, they're going to believe the new factories and how they have breaks and all this stuff now to enjoy that they did not have before. So America wins this war because of superior, superior machinery, new technology, new hardware. The working women. We also are going to have a unlimited raw material when it comes to war supplies. So America is going to become a major world power out of World War I. Mr. Wilson decided to enter the war late for one reason, to help make the peace accord as being the one who helped win the war. Mr. Wilson did some strange things here in this time period. He sat down and wrote what's called the 14 points. The 14 points is going to be a new way to reorganize the world. It's going to say that every country can be a sea power, that every, every country can use the seas to, 
for trade and so forth. They wanted every little ethnic group to have their own country. They went through and redrew all of Europe during this time period to give these ethnic people, like the Serbians, their own country uh, during this time period. Adolf Hitler will join them all back together again during the 1930s. He'll do all, he'll do all that without even firing a shot. He'll do, he'll do it all through nationalism. Another form of patriotism. Okay, guys, Mr. Wilson is going to call for a League of Nations, a World Congress, that every country of the world should have a member in the League of Nations. And their job is to stop disputes before they get out of hand, to stop warfare before it gets out of hand. Okay, he also calls for a world court to hold people accountable for what they do against humanity and are trying to cause new wars and other social issues. So he wants to form what is called the world court system. So Mr. Wilson's 14 points is gonna be an interesting situation because he believes that these 14 points will help him end wars in the future, that this will be the great war, the war that ended all wars. Well, he makes a big mistake. He decides to go to Europe for the peace conference. But he pretty much goes with the Long Ranger. He does take a few advisors with him. If I'd have been him, I'd have taken people out of Congress. I'd have taken cabinet members. I'd have taken military officials. I'd have me a pretty good sized entourage of like about 70 people who could go around the Versailles meeting and make the points the president cannot make because he's only one person. Y'all know the, the, premier, the prime minister of, of France made fun of Wilson. He's puritanical. He's a old, good old Methodist. I'm a good old Presbyterian boy. He don't know a thing about world peace. He's, he's, he's going to use his Bible to, to go through and make world peace. He don't know that God made the world in seven days. But yet he's got 14 points. Made fun of him. When Wilson reached Calais, Calais, France, he's going to board a train and go straight to Rome. He decides to go and see the Pope and gets the Pope's blessing first thing. Big mistake. These European leaders were not Catholic. The people of Germany were. Some of your Frenchmen were Catholics, but most everybody were Protestants. And that ticked them off too. Why bring the Pope into it? And he leaves Vatican City by train going to Versailles. And along the railroad tracks, day and night, are crowded crowds of people on both sides of the tracks that are hollering, Viva La Wilson, Viva La Wilson. He's a savior of Europe. He's a savior, a savior of Europe. He's the one who brought peace to Europe. And this really ticked off the Dutch, the French, the British. So when Wilson gets to the Treaty of Versailles, they don't have much to do with him. They just seem as being this little nerdy man that, that's, uh, that's trying to get his way. And Mr. Wilson was kind of a cold person. He was hard to warm up to. And he was very, he's very, uh, um, uh, exact in what he did. He's very, he's very um, um, set in how he did things and he wanted to change his mind. Nobody, nobody could talk to him, make him change his mind. He would not consider another person's view is going to be his way or no way. And so the Treaty of Versailles is a total, total failure, guys. The leaders of France and England decided to charge Germany for the entire war. They charged them $33 billion in war debt. And then France took part of Germany away from Germany, mainly the coal mines, to get restitution from the amount of coal they could produce to help pay for the war. It's a mess out here. Inflation in Germany was 9,000%. The inflation in Germany was the same amount as it was in the American South in 1866, 9,000% inflation. 
and Germany could not pay off this debt. Nobody would come in to help Germany at all. Finally, Calvin Coolidge is president in 1924, is going to send over Mr. Mr. Dawes out of Chicago. He's a big banker. He goes over with Herbert Hoover, who's the head of our Commerce Commission. And they go to Germany and they allow them to have close to $12 billion in which to rebuild German's infrastructure, trying to get Germany the economy rolling again in 1924. And with that money, they were told that they could not use that money to build a war machine. The industrialists who received this money are the ones who backed up Adolf Hitler and his rise to power in 1931. By 1934, Adolf Hitler is using his American money to build his war machine. Yes, guys, we paid for the Nazi regime. We pay for the Nazi war machine that caused World War II. You've got to be careful about who you sponsor and who you look to in the future. It can come back to haunt you. It can come back to haunt you real easily here in this time period. Well, guys, Mr. Mr. Wilson comes home, and he comes home to a different Congress than what he had in 1917. 1918 was midterm elections. Mr. Wilson had told the American people in 1916, I will keep you out of war. His slogan for the campaign of 1916 was, I have kept you out of war. One month after taking the inaugural oath, he declared war on Germany. Well, the first Tuesday of November is election day. And we had midterm elections on November and early November of 1918. The war is still going on. The war is going to be ended in one week. In one week, the war comes to an end but the American people didn't see this happening. And so they took the Democrats of Wilson's party out of the House and the Senate and replaced them with Republicans. Republicans took over the House and the Senate here in November of 1918. One week later, the war ended in Europe. If the war had ended in, at the end of October, Mr. Wilson would probably been in pretty good shape with the House and the Senate. One week made a big difference here in this election. And he comes home, and the head of the, the, head of the Senate is named Henry Cabot Lodge. And Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge does not believe in Wilson's 14 points. And in Congress, they discussed it. The big discussion was over the League of Nations, where all these different countries around the world would have one voice in the League of Nations which means the United States will only have one voice from the United States in the League of Nations. They didn't like this. And they used the racist N-word to describe the darker complexed, complexed people of the world. People from Siam, the people from India, Malaysia, they were all described by that old racist N-word by people in Congress. And they would not approve of the League of Nations or the World Court or any of the ideas that Mr. Wilson had toward world peace. So Mr. Wilson decided that he's gonna carry the message on the road. He got a presidential train car, got it all fixed up, hooked it back to passenger trains and freight trains going across the country and off he goes. Him and his new wife, Edith, are on the road. He tells the American people every 20 miles is a, is, a, is a little whistle stop, about a five minute stop to get water in the train engines. And the president for five minutes makes a speech. He made a hundred every day. They get to San Francisco, California toward the middle part of September. And they, they return on the Southern tier going across the country. And here on the 25th day of September, 
in Pablo, Colorado, Mr. Wilson has a stroke. They get back to the White House, where three days later, another stroke happens. This one is going to be a major one. The president is not able to do his duties, and he's in office until the, the 4th of March, 1921. So from the 1st of October of 1919 until March the 4th, 1921, we got a president who's totally incapacitated that cannot lead the nation. But his wife, Edith, has convinced everybody that he's okay and that she'll take the notes to him for him to make the decisions on. You know, once a week, she'd put him in the presidential Ford motor car. She put him on the back seat next to the window. He's got his head kind of slumped over and toward the window, and she's got his hand up doing this number. The man was totally out of it. In today's world, he would have been removed from office using the 25th Amendment. The vice president would become the new president. That's probably, that's probably what should have happened here. Because in the 1920 election, everything that Woodrow Wilson wanted to do, both Republicans and Democrats distanced themselves from it. They would not have anything to do with Woodrow Wilson's policies toward world peace. So guys, his 14 points are going to die. The League of Nations will be established England becomes the major country behind it. The United States never joins it. But we will join the world court in the late 1920s. But otherwise, we did not join the League of Nations, and so therefore, it is weak as water. We've been part of it. It's been a whole different ball game, guys. And we were not part of it. In 1942, after Pearl Harbor, people of this country got together and started discussing a new organization that is called the United Nations. The charter is written and the United Nations becomes an official body in the spring of 1945. The United States totally supported it, was behind it, and of course they choose New York City for the headquarters of the United Nations. That's the only reason that we're in the United Nations is we have to establish it and it's here in, on our, in our country, okay? So it's interesting you look at all this in World War I. President George Washington told the American people, never go to Europe for a war. It'll be a trap you'll never get out of. And Wilson thought that he could avoid the trap. Those European leaders had a different program, different agenda than Mr. Wilson had in this time period. You know, another area that happened here in this time period are the Jewish people. A lot of the German folks blame the Jewish people of their nation for causing World War I. Jews across Europe are going to be in dire straits during the 1920s. Here in England is a minister, a foreign minister. He had once been a prime minister. His name was Balfour, Lord Balfour. And Lord Balfour is going to call for a new Palestine. He wants to build a new Israel in the areas of Palestine, of Palestine. The areas of Palestine during this time period were, were controlled by Great Britain. And the League of Nations is going to set aside a little parcel to be called Israel during this time period. And a lot of Jewish people from Europe will return back into this area of Palestine trying to rebuild their homeland. But the vast majority did not go and because of this, in the 1930s, in the late 1930s, Adolf Hitler makes war against the Jews of Germany. His death camps come in, and over 6 million Jewish people will be murdered by Hitler before 1945. In 1947 and 1948, the push is made to bring back the full nation of Israel, and it does happen. It does happen in this time period. But Lord Balfour wanted to have Israel protected, these Jewish people protected in the 1920s and get them back to their homeland. But it just did not happen. Another thing that you guys to consider about this war is the new technologies. This war is going to really reinvent the airplane. 
this new technology will have air-cooled engines. You'll have smooth, smooth skin surfaces, so they'll be more aerodynamical. They'll be less drag. They'll have engines that produce more thrust. We're going to start building airplanes by 1925 that can carry people. You'll start seeing the airlines come into business during this time period. So aviation really evolves because of World War I. World War I brings in the radio. The radio will be used to have command between the ground and the air, between the sea and the land. And the radio is going to revolutionize how you fight wars. You're going to get troop movements and way to radio where troop movements are taking place and so forth. Get rid of the old courier system, as we used to have, by horseback, and now you'll have a radio to give commands. In 1923, the radio comes to American cities. New York, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Seattle, will all bring in radio stations. And the radio becomes so popular that by 1926, we've got radio networks that are gonna broadcast all kinds of radio shows and musical shows. The Grand Ole Opry, the, the, the Louisiana Hayride, all these shows start appearing on the radio here. And you start having people from vaudeville that go to the radio. People like Bob Hope and, um, and George uh, Burns and his wife, Gracie Allen. They all go to the radio during this time period. Jack Benny goes to the radio during this time period. So you start having all these radio shows, and most of these radio shows are going to be nothing more than dramas. These dramas are being produced by the makers of soap, like Lux and, Co and Colgate and these people of this nature, uh, Arm and Hammer. And these programs that these soap companies are, are sponsoring become what is known as soap operas. Little old problems among the people, problems among your community that are being solved on the radio here in these soap operas. And people tuned in to them like crazy. Okay, the car goes through major changes through World War I. The trucking industry comes out of World War I. The bus companies come out of World War I. And so you start seeing America change when it comes to the infrastructure and how people move around. They have buses, they have trucks, they have trains, they have automobiles. And so people can, tra can travel in various means here across the country. And this is going to revolutionize American transportation here. This new technology is going to really affect the older folks. The folks over the age of 50 are going to feel left out because new technology has replaced the, uh, the former technology of the horse and the wagon. You only get old if you cannot keep up with the new technology. I've learned that a long time ago. I've got to keep with technology in order to teach because Blackboard, a lot of people cannot, don't know how to go through and operate the Blackboard system and how to do the Zoom lectures and how to go through and do the, and, and, and write uh, articles and, and lecture notes and then put them into Word documents to put them on the Blackboard. They don't understand all this stuff. And so you've got to keep up the technology in order to grow and keep yourself motivated. If you don't, you're going to get old. And so a lot of the older Americans felt, felt left behind because the new technologies of World War I. Okay? All right. That kind of concludes our lecture on World War I. Y'all do look through the lecture notes. There are a lot more explanations in there. I explain a lot more detail, different items in different areas. Y'all can look in there, use it for your exam. And, of course, this lecture number six begins the second exam series. Lecture six, seven, eight, and nine are going to be part of the second exam for this class. Okay, so you have your first lecture done for this class, for this part of it, and I'll have the other three on here shortly. Okay, all right. Thanks, guys.